John chapter 20, verse 19 through 21. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Hi, my name is Cynthia, and I'm a child of God, and I'm here to share with you the gospel, um, which is the good news. So, what is the good news? Well, John 14, 6 tells us, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I hope you don't mind I have an air conditioner on because it's very warm, as I'm sure some of you know. Um, God is holy, without sin, and righteous, which means he's just. We are all sinners. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all deserve death and separation from God due to our sins. For the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 But the good news tells us that God loves us even though we are sinners. God has given his only begotten son in order to pay for our sins. Jesus Christ died on the cross in our place and rose from, and rose from the grave. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4 says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Heaven is a free gift for sinners. We receive this gift only by faith and only through Christ. It is not a reward for those who do good works. Um, for by grace you have been saved. Through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9. God promises us that Whoever believes only in his Son, Jesus Christ, for salvation can know with absolute certainty that they have eternal life. Um, 1 John 5, 11 through 13 tells us, And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. God promises us that we can never lose our salvation. God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ are who keeps us saved. 1 John um, chapter 5 goes on to say in verses 29 and 30, or 28 and 29, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So would you accept the fact that you deserve hell, since that is God's judgment? But at the same time, God loves us in such a way that he has given his Son to die on the cross in our place. Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins. So by simply believing in him, Instead of our good works, we can be saved. If you trust in Jesus Christ alone to obtain the gift of salvation, God guarantees that you are eternally secure in him and you will be with him forever. Now, through his gospel, um, Jesus Christ provides us with an inner peace that surpasses the peace that the world offers. If we look to him with faith, we can feel his presence in any circumstance. The Savior taught, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Now, it's been a crazy week of news and um, speculations and um, doctrines <sighs> um, and just people's opinions. I mean, you can't get away from it. And I want to address a few of those, um, but I want to talk to you about how we can find peace in these end times, how we can find peace in, in this chaos. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Antichrist, um, a little bit about the world that we're in today, um, because that's what matters, right? We need to study God's word, and we um, will learn 
to find peace in Jesus. Um, we know bad things are coming, but we have nothing to fear. Eyes on Jesus, because um, he's got it all under control. At some point in our life's journey, we come to realize how inadequate we are to deal with all that life throws our way. Um, at some point we realize that the things we fought so hard to attain or to achieve simply did not satisfy our desires or meet our expectations. And at some point we realize we cannot fill the lingering void in our heart on our own. No matter what you try to fill it with, you just can't. It's still there. There's just this hole. And it's so... It leaves you just with this empty feeling. I mean, while the, pursuit of, the pursuits of pleasure, relationships, money, power, and other things may satisfy us for a very short time, we ultimately find that the empty longing inside us returns. It is at this point that we discover the strength to fill this void can only come from the one who placed it there. Um, we discover the love and the power of our um, risen Lord and Savior. We discover Jesus. God created us to have a relationship with him and to experience true lasting peace in this life. That missing peace inside every man, woman, and child is caused by our separation from God which is a direct result of our sin. So here's what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And Romans 3.23 says it like this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, people have tried many ways to, rest um, to restore the lost relationship with God but no amount of effort or good deeds on our part can ever pay for our sin. Titus 3, 5 says he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. And um, Proverbs 14, 12 says there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And Jesus answered in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin and restore our lost relationship with God. Um, let's read what the Bible says um, in a few more verses. John 3, 16, and we're going to say through 17 because people like to skip that. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. For God did not said, send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Um, 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ died for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And Romans um, 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I want to make sure I got the um, scripture right. It was 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ died for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. That was 1 Peter 3.18. And Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were still sinners, and he died for us. He knew what we were going to do. He knew our past, present, and future sins. We weren't even born yet. We weren't even a thought on the map when Jesus Christ died for us. And make no mistake, he died personally for you. He sees the timeline. He knows who his sheep are. He knows who's going to be spending eternity with him. And that's why God didn't destroy, completely destroy the entire earth and start over with new people. Because he knows who we are. And that's an amazing, wonderful thought, and you can take comfort in that. He knows you. Just knowing all of this intellectually is not enough. We must act upon it by trusting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, believing in him by faith, and receiving his free gift of salvation. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. John 
chapter 1, verse 12 says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I am a child of God. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Put on this, the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and your faith and your trust is in him, you have nothing to fear. Romans 10 um, verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I will never deny Jesus. Never. You can receive Jesus Christ right now, wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you've done. There are no exact words that you have to pray. You simply put your faith in him. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ to save you, you can know for sure that God heard you and has forgiven your sins. The Bible says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved in Romans 10, 13. And 1 John 5, 12 through 13 says, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. It's an amazing feeling of peace and joy to know that we are in the Father's hands. And Jesus is coming soon. But when you look at this world around us, it can be quite scary and overwhelming. And with all the false teachers and false prophets and false everything, you have, I mean, the lies, evil's being called good, good is being called evil. And you kind of, you start to wonder, is there truth anywhere? Is anybody even telling the truth anymore? Um, you can go to your Bible. So, if there's anything that will spark a spontaneous debate, um, if not an outright argument, it is a discussion involving politics, even among believers. As followers of Christ, what should be our attitude and our involvement with politics? It has been said that religion and politics don't mix, but is that really true? Can we have political views outside the considerations of our Christian faith? The answer is no, we cannot. The Bible gave us two truths regarding our stance towards politics and government. And the first truth is that the will of God permeates and supersedes every aspect of life. It is God's will that takes precedence over everything and everyone. Matthew 6.33 God's plans and purposes are fixed and his will is inviolable. Um, what he has proposed, um, proposed, he will bring to pass, and no government can thwart his will. Read Daniel 4, chapter 34 through 35. In fact, it is God who sets up kings and disposes and deposes them. Now Daniel 2, 21. Um, because the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Daniel 4.17 A clear understanding of this truth will help us to see that politics is merely a method God uses to accomplish his will. Even though evil men abuse their political power, meaning it all for evil, God means it for good, working all things together for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Now, second, we must grasp the fact that our government cannot save us. Only God can. We never read in the New Testament of Jesus or any of the apostles expending any time or energy schooling believers on how to reform the pagan world of its idolatrous, immoral, and corrupt practices via the government. When have you ever seen that? The apostles never called for believers to demonstrate civil disobedience, to protest the Roman Empire's unjust laws or brutal schemes. Instead, the apostles um, commanded the first century Christians, um, as well as us today, to proclaim the gospel and live lives that give clear evidence to the gospel's transforming power. There is no doubt that our responsibility to government is to obey the laws and be good citizens. Romans chapter 13, 1 through 2.
God has established all authority and he does so for our benefit to commend those who do right. 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 through 15. Now, Paul tells us in Romans 13, 1 through 8, that it is the government's responsibility to rule in authority over us, hopefully for our good, to collect taxes and to keep the peace. Where we have a voice and can elect our leaders, we should exercise that right by voting for those who best demonstrate Christian principles. One of Satan's grandest deceptions is that we can rest our hope for cultural morality and godly living in politicians and government officials. A nation's hope for change is not to be found in any country's ruling class. The church has made a mistake if it thinks that it is the job of politicians to defend, to advance, and to guard biblical truths and Christian values. The church's unique, God-given purpose does not lie in political activism. Nowhere in scripture do we have the directive to spend our energy, our time, or our money in government, um, in governmental affairs. Our mission lies not in changing the nation through political reform, but in changing hearts through the word of God. When believers think the growth and influence of Christ can somehow be allied with government policy, they corrupt the mission of the church. Our Christian mandate is to spread the gospel of Christ and to preach against the sins of our time. Only as the hearts of individuals in a culture are, um, are changed by Christ will the culture begin to reflect that change. <sighs> so believers throughout the ages have lived and even flourished under antagonistic, repressive pagan governments and this was especially true of the first century believers who, under merciless political regimens, um, sustained their faith under immense cultural stress. They understood that it was they, not their government, who were the light of the world and the salt of the earth. They adhered to Paul's teaching to obey their govern governing authorities, even to honor, respect, and pray for them. Romans 13, 1 through 8. Uh, but more importantly, they understood that as believers, their hope resided in the protection that only God supplies. The same holds true for us today. When we follow the teachings of the scriptures, we become the light of the world as God has intended for us to be. In Matthew 15 verse 16, political entities are not the savior of the world. The salvation of all mankind has been manifested in Jesus Christ. God knew that our world needed saving long before any national government was ever founded. He demonstrated to the world that, redem um, that redemption could not um, be accomplished through the power of man or economic strength, military might, or politics. Peace of mind, contentment, hope, and joy, and the salvation of mankind are provided only through Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, also, I want to talk about Israel, another nation that is chosen by God and protected by God. Christians should definitely support the nation of Israel. We must remember that Israel, the nation, is very special to God. We read in Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8, these words, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh king of Egypt. God's eternal purpose is to bless the world through Israel. Already he has done so in measure, for salvation is from the Jews, John 4, 22. But the fullness of future blessings, um, blessing is indicated in the wondrous promise um, of Isaiah 27, verse 6. In days to come, Jacob will take root Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. Now I made a video about how Israel has blessed America. Scroll through my videos and find it if you're interested. And I went into great detail. Um, 
the declaration that salvation is from the Jews suggests our immeasurable debt to Israel. All that we have worth, um, all that we have worth having has come to us through the Jews. Our Bible is a Jewish book and our Savior is a Jewish Savior. Let us never forget to pray for God's chosen people. It is true that Israel is currently in rebellion against God because of their rejection of Christ. The nation is a secular, unbelieving as to the claims of Scripture and their Messiah, Jesus Christ. Um, they're an unbelieving nation. But at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Romans 11, verse, f verse 5. <laughs> Sorry, some Jews are being saved and are becoming members of the body of Christ through faith in their Messiah. Jews, <clears throat> Jews are biblically speaking the chosen people of God and dearly loved by him. Another reason for Christians to support the nation of Israel is because, the, because of the Abrahamic covenant. We read God's promise in Genesis 12, two through three. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. You can also see Genesis 27, 29, and Numbers 24, verse 9. I never um, end a prayer without blessing Israel. God, please bless Israel. Free the hostages. Be with them. Give them comfort, strength, courage. Set the Holy Spirit on them and bring them to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, one of the United States' most worthwhile accomplishments has been its consistent regard for the plight of the Jewish nation. No nation in the history of the world has a better record of treating individual Jews with respect than does America. The same can be said for our befriending, befriending Israel as a nation. America has committed many sins for which, um, for which we may well deserve judgment. Um, and the way we've been turning from Israel and all of the anti-Semitism that we're seeing today, um, we, we do, we, we're, we're going to be facing judgment. But as a nation, we have been a consistent friend of the Jews and the nation of Israel, and many of us still are, as well as benefact, um, benefactors. In 1948, President Harry Truman helped helped persuade the United Nations to recognize Israel as a nation. And since then, the United States has contributed billions of dollars in aid to Israel. Now, I understand that right now we're not giving them anything from what I, from what I can gather. Biden's put a stop to any help. But I think that's going to turn around. I hope it turns around or that Jesus takes us out of here very soon um, because we, we know how it ends. We know that um, America is not going to stand with Israel in the end. Um, that makes me think the church will be gone. That makes me think the, the rapture is very soon, any moment. Um, from the biblical declarations of God's love and care for his chosen people, the nation of Israel, and from the history of nations being destroyed because of their evil dealings with God's chosen people, the Jews, Christian believers should give support to the chosen people of God. This is not to say that we necessarily support the methods they use in their relationships with the Arab nations. Um, the Bible warned that conflict would always characterize the relations between the descendants of Isaac and Ishmael. Sadly, this conflict will continue until Jesus comes back to judge the nations and set up his 1,000 uh, year reign of peace on earth. We must look at the big picture with a biblical worldview. While we do not have to support everything Israel does as, a, does as a nation, we most definitely should support Israel's right to exist. God will fulfill his promises and covenants with Israel. God still has a plan for Israel. Genesis 12, 3 says, Woe to anyone who seeks to defeat that plan. Whoever curses you, I will curse. Genesis 12, 3, whoever curses you, I will curse. 
um, it is common for people to seek to demonize those with whom they disagree politically. Calling a person the Antichrist is essentially declaring him or her to be Satan incarnate. Some of the far right were and still are convinced that former President Barack Obama was or is the Antichrist. Um, some who hold to the far left political views were convinced that President George Bush was the Antichrist. Now, those who disagree with the political views of President Donald Trump are throwing the Antichrist label at him as well. This political demonization is ridiculous as the biblical indicators of who the Antichrist is have nothing to do with the conservative or progressive politics. Um, especially, I've been seeing um, since the assassination attempt when President um, Trump took a bullet through the ear, through, through his earlobe, and God turned his head at the last second, um, protecting him. He, he should be dead, and he said, I should be dead. And he, gives, he, he gave glory to God. God if it wasn't for God, I would be dead. He gives glory to God. Um, the Antichrist isn't going to do that. Um, another thing I'm seeing is that people are taking um, scripture from Revelation, which tells us that the Antichrist will receive a mortal, um, a mortal head wound and that he will rise again and people will um, wonder after him. Now, to compare what happened this, this, this assassination attempt on Trump and what the Bible says in Revelation about the mortal wound that the Antichrist will receive is ridiculous. Um, it's absolutely unbiblical because, for one, we're not in the tribulation. Um, I believe that this happens at midpoint. The Antichrist, um, it's, it's at about midpoint of the tribulation. When the Antichrist will be um, wounded in the head, he will rise. And I believe that when he rises, that will be when Satan is thrown down. And the second half of the tribulation begins, the great tribulation, and Satan is full of rage because he knows he has very little time left. Um, Donald Trump is not the Antichrist because the Antichrist is not going to give glory to God. The Antichrist is not going to be pointing people to Jesus, which Trump does. Um, another thing, at the, what is it, the CNN this our um this conference that they just had um somebody some lady a uh, sheik from a you know said a prayer at the end um and people bowed their heads and were praying at this convention um republican convention um to a, another god not to god to a little g god to a false god um a lot of people are saying oh look at that but, you know, I was watching Trump while this was going on or whatever footage I could find of him, and he didn't look happy about it. Um, Trump does not believe in um, false gods. He does believe in one God, our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And while he sat there respectfully, I didn't see him bow his head. I didn't see him close his eyes. He did not appear to be praying. However, separation of church and state, what do you want him to do? Jump up and say no? stop this right now um he'll never get elected that way we have freedom of religion we have freedom of speech and he um is like like us he is an american but he has a bigger responsibilities he has to protect um freedom of religion um that's all religion or or we're not we're, we'll lose our freedoms so I don't know what people expected him expect him to do he didn't plan that he didn't set that up and um, he didn't appear to go along with it. I did not see him praying to another God. I saw a woman very, um, deceived, you know, evil's out there and it's, it's going to permeate every, every aspect of our culture. We see it all around us. And, um, if we, we would, if you've been on Facebook trying to stand up for your beliefs, you see the struggle. It's exhausting. But, um, I think I already covered our responsibility. We are to share the gospel. And I'm more interested in watching to see um, what Trump has to say about his faith going forward. Um, so that's, that's what I want to see. <sighs> um, second, Christians in the United States. Let me think. 
I'm gonna think. Um, I kind of got off on a tangent there, but yeah, um, Christians in the United States do tend to forget that the end times revolve around the nation of Israel, not the United States. The Bible nowhere explicitly prophesies the existence of the United States. While the United States may have a role in the end times or be somehow associated with the Antichrist, the uniquely evil end times world leader, um, it is also possible that the United States will not even exist in the end times. The Americanization of Bible prophecy is unwarranted. Um, many are saying um, today that New York is the city of Babylon that will be destroyed. Um, I believe that America is um, going to be under judgment, and we already are seeing the beginning of that. Um, I don't, I don't know that America will even be here um, during the tribulation. You know how many rulers, leaders out there want to nuke us, hate us? Um, how, ma how many people have come in illegally? It's like they're making an army here and they're going to take us up from the inside. I, I don't even know that America will be here, let alone an American president to be the Antichrist. Um, there is so much speculation about the identity of the Antichrist. And for those of you who are um, concerned that I'm talking about this because well, we're going to discuss it a little bit because there's a lot of talk about it out there. And um, any, maybe some, maybe this message will reach someone left in the tribulation. But the thing is, we, we aren't going to be here during the tribulation. So it's not something that we need to worry about. But we do need to address it based on what's happening in the world today. Um, some of the more popular targets are Vladimir Putin... Prince William, Pope Francis, um, in the United States, former President Barack Obama and Donald Trump are the most frequent targets. So, who is the Antichrist, and how 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 will they how will he be recognized? Well, the Bible really does not say anything specific about where the Antichrist will come from. Many scholars speculate that he will come from a confederacy of ten nations, and or a reborn Roman Empire. Um, they get this from Daniel 7, 24 through 25 and Revelation 17, verse 7. Others see him as having to be a Jew in order to claim to be the Messiah. It's all just speculation since the Bible does not specifically say where the Antichrist will come from or what, what ethnicity he will be. Um, I can't help but look at um, Saudi Arabia. Um, but one day... The Antichrist will be revealed. Second Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4 tells us how we how we will recognize the Antichrist. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called good or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Now that's going to happen right at the midpoint. Um, but before that, he's going to confirm a covenant with many. If you um, are left behind after millions of people vanish, um, I would strongly recommend that you just take that as you're in the tribulation. I don't know how long there's going to be. If there, if, I don't know if there'll be a gap, but I would be very, very concerned and I would drop to my knees in that exact moment immediately and pray. Um, it is likely that most people who are alive when the Antichrist is revealed will be very surprised at, at his identity. The Antichrist may or may not be alive today. Martin Luther was convinced that the Pope in his time was the Antichrist. During the 1940s, many believed Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist. I mean, can you? of course they did. Um, others who have lived in the past few hundred years have been equally sure as to the identity of the Antichrist, and so far, they've all been incorrect. We should um, put speculations behind us and focus on what the Bible actually says about the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 5 through 8 declares, The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to ex exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them, and he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. 
all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Those who are written in the Lamb's book of life will not be worshiping this beast. Um, distractions and misinformation aside, we still have the question, is it possible that Donald Trump is the Antichrist? There are a few things that argue against Donald Trump. Um, Do There's a few things that, um, aside from what I've already discussed with you, that argue against Donald Trump's being the Antichrist. Bible prophecy experts still debate the authenticity of um, the Antichrist, and some believe that the Antichrist will be of Jewish descent, as he would have to be a Jew in order for the Jews to consider him the Messiah. Others believe that the Antichrist will come from a revived Roman Empire, the ten horns of the beast in Revelation chapter 17 verse 3, most likely associated with modern day Europe. Donald Trump is not European, unless you consider the U.S. part of Europe in terms of biblical prophecy and not eth ethnicity um, or religiously Jewish. Donald Trump claims to have faith in Jesus Christ as his savior. While anyone can make such claims, it seems unlikely that the Antichrist would even pretend to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, there are a few characteristics the Bible ascribes to the Antichrist that are similar to traits possessed by, Don um, by Donald Trump. Donald Trump is undeniably a charismatic, intelligent, and determined individual. Um, often thousands of people attend events when Trump speaks. Donald Trump has the ability to inspire millions of people. The Antichrist, who will be the leader of a one-world government system in the end times, would also have to possess charisma, intelligence, and determination. It will take such a person to deceive the entire world in the end times. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. Probably the most important factor, though, in identifying the Antichrist is a relationship with the nation of Israel. Now, the Bible teaches that the Antichrist will forge a seven-year peace covenant with Israel, but then break the covenant after three and a half years, Daniel 9.27. The Antichrist will then essentially attempt a second holocaust, the annihilation of the nation of Israel and Jews around the world. Donald Trump has stated... <sighs> Sorry. Um, Donald Trump has stated his strong support for the nation of Israel. Trump claims that he will come to Israel's defense should it be attacked. Interestingly, Trump has um, described negotiating peace between Israel and the Palestinians as the ultimate deal. It is possible that some form of agreement between Israel and the Palestinians will be part of the end time seven year peace covenant. Um, I think we need to keep watching Israel. I'm also very curious about what's coming with um, the Abrahamic Accords or um, Saudi Arabia, um, a peace deal with Saudi Arabia and Israel. We've got a lot to watch. The, S the SCG um, summit, a seven-year plan, um, maybe that'll be confirmed. We shall see. So is Donald Trump the Antichrist? Um, while Trump does possess some traits that are similar to the Bible's description of the Antichrist, the same could be said of many world leaders. And further, there are serious questions regarding whether it is possible that the Antichrist could be a non-Jewish, non-Semitic person. Um, in my evaluation, it is highly unlikely that Donald Trump is the Antichrist. Ultimately, though, the answer to the question has to be wait and see. Uh, Insert any other name into that question, and the answer remains the same. Wait and see. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.3 states that the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, will be revealed when the rebellion occurs. It will be abundantly clear who he is when the time comes. Rather than speculating about various scenarios and demonizing people with whom we disagree, our, our responsibility is to be wise and discerning based on what the Bible says about the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3 through 4, and Revelation 13, 1 through 4. Um, go back and check out the last video right before this one that I just posted. Um, it's very possible that Donald Trump is a born-again believer, and if he is, he's going to be leaving with us in the rapture. And um, if you're looking at, I mean, which could happen at any moment, 
But if you're looking at maybe the Feast of Trumpets, which is a lot of people's favorite time to be really watchful. Um, I, don't, I won't set dates. I don't know. But that would be very interesting because the Feast of Trumpets this year is before the election, one month before the election. And if we leave on that day and Trump is leaves on that day, what a statement that will be to the world. Um, but as I said, I don't know when the rapture is going to happen. Um, I don't know if it'll be at the Feast of Trumpets. I just know Jesus is coming soon. Um, let's talk about the false prophet. As long as we're talking about the Antichrist, why don't we talk a little bit about the false prophet? Um, I do want to get back, and I promise, for those of you who thought, oh, I thought we were going to be talking about peace. We are. Um, peace in the end times. Peace through the chaos. We are. We will be. Um, but I want to get a few things out of the way, and I promise you I'll bring you back. So stay with me. Um, the false prophet at the end times is described in Revelation 13, 11 through 15. He is also referred to as the second beast. And he's referred to that a lot. Uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, chapter 16, verse 13, chapter 19, verse 20, and chapter 20, verse 10. Um, together with the Antichrist and Satan, uh, who empowers both of them, the false prophet is the third party in the unholy trinity. Now, the Apostle John um, described this person and gives us clues to identifying him um, when he shows up. First, he comes out of the earth. This could mean he comes up from the pit of hell with all the demonic powers of hell at his command. It could also mean he comes from lowly circumstances, secret and unknown, until he bursts on the world stage at the right hand of the Antichrist. He is depicted as having horns like a lamb while speaking like a dragon. The horns on lambs are merely small bumps on their heads until the lamb, um, until the lamb grows into a ram. Um, rather than having the Antichrist's multiplicity of heads and horns showing power and might and fierceness, the false prophet comes like a lamb, winsomely, with persuasive words that elicit sympathy and goodwill from others. He may be an extraordinary preacher or orator whose demonically empowered um, words will deceive the multitudes, but he speaks like a dragon, which means his message is the message of, of a dragon. Revelation 12, 9 identifies the dragon as the devil and Satan. Um, verse 12 gives us the false prophet's mission on earth, which is to force humanity to worship the Antichrist. He has all the authority of the Antichrist because... Like him, the false prophet is empowered by Satan. It is not clear whether people are forced to worship the Antichrist or whether they are so enamored of these powerful beings that they fall for um, the deception and worship him willingly. The fact that the second beast uses miraculous signs and wonders, including fire from heaven, to establish the credibility of both of them um, would it would seem to indicate that People will fall before them in adoration of their power and their message. Now verse 14 goes on to say, The deception will be so great that the people will set up an idol to the Antichrist, the image of the beast, and worship it. This is reminiscent of the huge golden image of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel um, chapter 3, um, before which all were to bow down and pay homage. Now Revelation 14, 9 through 11, however, describes the ghastly fate that awaits those who worship the image of the Antichrist. Um, those who survive the terrors of the tribulation to this point will be faced with two hard choices. Those who refuse to worship the image of the beast will be subject to death. Revelation 13 verse 15. But those who do worship him will incur the wrath of God. The image will be extraordinary in that it will be able to speak. Whatever the image is, a statue, a hologram, an android, AI, a human-animal hybrid, a clone. I believe AI is a very good possibility. Look at what the technology we have in the world today. Um, it will, it will have some kind of ability to breathe forth the message of the Antichrist and the false prophet, along with um, being the spokesman for them. The image will condemn to death those who refuse to worship the unholy pair. Um, in our technological world. It's not hard to imagine such a scenario. 
but 2,000 years ago, they would have had a very difficult time understanding these passages. Um, but whoever the, pro um, the false prophet turns out to be, the final world deception and the final apostasy will be great, and the whole world will be caught up in it. The deceivers and false teachers we see today are the forerunners of the Antichrist and the false prophet, and we must not be deceived by them. These false teachers abound, and they are moving us towards a final satanic kingdom. We must faithfully, very faithfully proclaim the saving gospel of Jesus Christ and rescue the souls of men and women from the coming disaster. Um, most people would define peace of mind as the absence of mental stress and anxiety. The expression peace of mind conjures up images of like a Buddha-like composure wherein calm, um, wherein calm, comfort, and composure are so prevalent that nothing can disturb the one who has peace of mind. A placid person is said to have peace of mind. The only time peace of mind is found in the Bible is in the um, NIV translation of 2 Corinthians 2.13, where Paul says he found no peace of mind because he didn't find Titus in Troas. Uh, the, literal, the literal translation of this phrase is, rest of my spirit. The Bible uses the word peace in several different ways. Peace sometimes refers to a state of friendship between God and man. The peace between a holy God and sinful mankind has been affected by Christ's sacrificial death, having made peace through the blood of his cross, Colossians 1.20. Um, in addition, as high priest, the Lord Jesus maintains that state of friendship on behalf of all who continue to come to God by him, see, and he always lives to make intercession for them, Hebrews 7.25. This state of friendship with God is a prerequisite for the second kind of peace, that which sometimes refers to a tranquil mind. It is only when we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ that we can experience the true peace of mind that is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. In other words, his fruit exhibited in us. Um, Galatians 5.22 So Isaiah 26.3 tells us that God will keep us in perfect peace if our minds are stayed on him, meaning our minds um, lean on him, center on him, and trust in him. Our tranquility of mind is perfect um, or imperfect to the degree that the mind is stayed on God rather than ourselves and our problems. Peace is experienced as we believe what the Bible says about God's nearness, as in Psalm 139 verses 1 through 12 and about his goodness and power, his mercy and love for his children, and his complete sovereignty over all of life's circumstances. But we can't trust someone we don't know, and it is crucial, therefore, to come to know intimately the Prince of Peace, who is Jesus Christ. Peace is experienced as a result of prayer. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians um, chapter 4, 6-7 through seven. A peaceful mind and heart are experienced as a result of recognizing that an all-wise and all-loving Father has a purpose in our trials. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Romans eight twenty eight. God can bring a variety of good things, including peace from the affliction that we experience. Even the discipline and chastising, um, chastising of the Lord will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness in our lives. Um, Hebrews 12:11. They provide a fresh opportunity for hoping in God and eventually praising Him. Psalms um, 43, verse 5. They help us comfort others when they undergo similar trials, and they achieve for us an eternal glory that far out outweighs them all. Peace of mind and the tranquility of spirit that accompanies it are only available when we have true peace with God through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross in payment for our sins. And those who attempt to find peace in worldly pursuits will find themselves sadly deceived. For Christians, however, 
Peace of mind is available through the intimate knowledge of and complete trust in the God who meets all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 In prophesy, um, prophesizing an extremely dark period of punishment in Israel's history, Isaiah sees even further forward to a future time of hope and deliverance. The prophet announces that the Lord will send a Redeemer, the promised Messiah, to usher in a new day. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6. The prophecy reveals that the Messiah will be human born, uh, uh, will be a human-born male child upon whose shoulders the government will rest. The Hebrew word translated as government in Isaiah 9-6 means dominion, power, or sovereignty through legal authority. Israel's savior was to be a sovereign king who would rule on David's throne. Um, see Psalm 132, 10 through 18. Uh, the prophecy um, continues to disclose that the Messiah's government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. Um, seven centuries later, the angel Gabriel announced the Messiah's birth to his mother Mary. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Luke 1, 32-33 the, um, this language of placing dominion or the government on someone's shoulders symbolizes royal authority. In Isaiah 22, 22, um, Eliakim is to be given Shebna's position of power and influence as King Hezekiah's administrator. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Revelation 3, 7. Um, links this passage to the sovereign rule granted to the Messiah, to the Messiah, King Jesus. Um, as Jesus prepares to send out his disciples, he told them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Matthew 28, 18. All the supreme rulers of God's heavenly kingdom, um, Jesus Christ, must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. And that's in 1 Corinthians 15, 25. Um, as we consider these words, the government will be on his shoulders. We can't help but think of the cross our Lord carried on his shoulders while a crown of thorns was resting on his brow. Justin uh, Mar Martyr, the second century philosopher turned Christian teacher, um, recognized this imagery as signifying the power of the cross, which at his crucifixion he placed on his shoulders. In a um, InterVarsity Press, um, um, illustration. Um, so Jesus Christ had the divine government, the dominion, power, and authority of the kingdom of heaven on his shoulders when he bore the cross for our sins. Um, for it was by this act that he conquered sin, death, hell, and the devil. The apostle Paul acknowledges that Jesus is the head over every ruler and authority. Um, his sacrifice on the cross canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Colossians chapter 2, 14 through 15. Um, Jesus Christ ushered in a glorious new day for all humanity when the king humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians chapter 2, 8 through 11. Um, one day during the millennial kingdom, Christ will rule from Zion, and the world will see the government placed on his shoulders. It's coming. Um, the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of our Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Revelation 11, verse 15. When Jesus sits on the throne of David, 
in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as, as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. Um, hope, deliverance, and peace for God's people were established when Jesus Christ endured the cross. Now he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Um, Hebrews 12, verse 2. The highest government in all creation with power to exercise absolute dominion over every being in heaven and on earth will be on his shoulders for all eternity. Psalm 146, verse 10. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Revelation 17, verse 14. And Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. Jeremiah was a prophet of God, proclaiming that judgment was coming upon Jerusalem. However, Jeremiah was opposed by the king and the priests who did not want to hear his message. In their opinion, Jeremiah's message of surrendering to Babylon amounted to treason. Um, false prophets who claimed to speak for God also contradicted Jeremiah's message. Jeremiah proclaimed bloodshed, destruction, and judgment when Babylon conquered um, Jerusalem. The false prophets, on the other hand, said that the future of Jerusalem looked bright. Jerusalem could look forward to peace, not war. The phrase peace, peace, when there is no peace, is found in Jeremiah 6.14, as well as Jeremiah 8.11. It is also found in Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 10 and 16. In all four places, it has the same meaning in the same historical context. Um, Jeremiah was like a doctor delivering bad news to his patient. His diagnosis was that unless, um, unless drastic measures were taken, the patient would die. However, the false prophets gave a second opinion. Don't listen to Jeremiah, they said. You are going to be just fine. Instead of radical surgery and a drastic change of lifestyle, the priests and false prophets said a light bandage was all that was needed. Um, the following passage is found in Jeremiah 6, 13-14 and repeated exactly in Jeremiah 8, 10-11. From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike all practice deceit. They dress the wounds of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. When the priests and false prophets said, peace, peace, they were denying that judgment was on the way. They were giving the people false assurances. The explicit assumption is that Jerusalem and Judah had not committed grievous sins and that God was not displeased with them. In fact, according to the false prophets, God was quite happy with his people and wanted to bless them. They promised peace, peace. Unfortunately, their promised peace would not come. The book of Jeremiah bears this out, and in the end, Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon, just as God said. The prophet Ezekiel says something similar. Because the false prophets lead my people astray, saying, Peace when there is no peace, and because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash, Therefore, tell those who cover it with whitewash that it is going to fall. Rain will come in torrents, and I will send hailstones hurtling down, and violent winds will burst forth. Ezekiel 13, 10-11 In the same passage, God says, So I will pour out my wrath against the wall and against those who covered it with whitewash. I will say to you, the wall is gone, and so are those who whitewashed it. Those prophets of Israel who prophesied to Jerusalem and saw visions of peace for her when there was no peace, declares the Sovereign Lord. Verses 15 through 17. Um, there are still false prophets and religious leaders today who issue false promises of peace when there is no peace. The message of peace and prosperity sells. Some preachers and teachers today say that the Christian life is all about peace and prosperity. But God does not promise that. There are others who ignore or downplay the seriousness of sin and teach that God is not concerned with their behavior. Others deny that eternal judgment awaits the unrepentant sinner, even though God has promised just the opposite. These are modern examples of false prophets promising peace when there is no peace. Paul tells Timothy to preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage. 
with great patience and careful instruction, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4. People like to hear good news, and they do not want to hear that hardship may be God's will for them in this life, or that judgment is certain after death. Christians have the job of delivering bad news because the bad news must be embraced before the good news can be effective. If you don't think that you need a savior, then why would you ask for a savior? If you don't think you're a sinner, why would you think that you need a savior? I mean, really, why would you? You're fine, right? God bore witness against the people to whom Isaiah was sent to minister, calling them rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to um, the Lord's instruction. Isaiah 39, um, some people have closed their ears to the word of the Lord and desire to hear only peace when there is no peace. They say to God's prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Um, prophesy illusions. Stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Verses 10 through 11. But God our Father has seen fit to grant us in the heart of his Son infinite treasures of love mercy and affection. If we want to find evidence that God loves us, that he not only listens to our prayers but anticipates them, we need to follow the same line of thought as St. Paul. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not also give up all things in him? Grace renews a man from within and converts a sinner and <sighs> converts a sinner and a rebel into a good and faithful servant. The source of all grace is God's love for us, and he has revealed this not just in words but also in deeds. It was divine love which led the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Word, the Son of God the Father, to take on our flesh, our human condition, everything except sin. And the Word, the Word, the Word of God is the Word from which the Lord proceeds. Um, love is revealed to us in the Incarnation the redemptive journey which Jesus Christ made on our earth, culminating in the supreme sacrifice of the cross. And on the cross, it showed itself through a new sign. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. The water and blood of Jesus speak to us of a self-sacrifice brought to the last extreme. It is finished. Everything is achieved for the sake of love. That's how much he loves us. Today, when we consider once more the central mysteries of our faith, we are surprised to see how very human gestures are used to express the deepest truths. The love of God, the Father who gave up his Son, and the Son's love which calmly lead, um, leads him to Calvary. God does not approach us in power and authority. No, he takes the form of a servant being born in the, likeliness, um, in the likeness of man. Jesus is never distant or aloof, although sometimes in his preaching he seems very sad because he is hurt by the, evil men, um, by the evil that men do. However, if we watch him closely, we will note immediately that his anger comes from love. It is a further invitation for us to leave infidelity and, um, and sin behind. Have I, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, says the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? These words explain Christ's whole life. They allow us to understand why he has come to us with a heart made of flesh, a heart like ours. This is convincing proof of his love and constant witness to the mystery of divine charity. I must confide to you something which makes me very sorry and spurs me on to action. The thought of all those people who do not yet know Christ, who do not even suspect the great good fortune which awaits us in heaven. They live like blind men, looking for a joy whose real name they don't know, lost on roads which takes them away from true happiness. How well one understands what Paul the Apostle must have felt that night in Troas when he had a vision in a dream, 
a man in Macedonia was standing was standing beseechingly, um, beseeching him, and saying, "Come over to Macedonia and help us." And when he had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go on to Macedonia, including um, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I mean, don't you feel that God is calling us? Through the things which happen around us, he is urging us to proclaim the good news of coming um, of the coming Jesus. Yet sometimes we Christians turn um, turn our calling into something very paltry. We become superficial and waste our time in dissension and jealousy. Or worse still, some people are artificially scandalized by the way others choose to live certain aspects of their faith. Instead of doing all they can to help others, they set out to destroy and to criticize. It is true that sometimes you find serious shortcomings in Christians' lives, but the important thing is not ourselves and our shortcomings. The only thing that matters is Jesus. It is Christ we must, we must talk about, not ourselves. Um, these reflections have been provoked by suggestions that there is a crisis in devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. But there is no crisis. True devotion is the sac um, to the to the Sacred Heart has always been and is still truly alive, full of human and supernatural meaning. It has led and still leads to conversion, self-giving fulfillment of God's will, and loving understanding of the mysteries of the redemption. However, we must distinguish this genuine devotion from displays of useless sentimentality, a veneer of piety devoid of doctrine. No less, um, no less than you, I, I dislike surgery statuses, um, figures, figures of the heart which are in, incapable of inspiring any trace of the devotion in people who have the common sense and supernatural outlook of a Christian. But it is bad logic to turn these particular abuses, which are disappearing anyway, into some sort of doctrinal theological problem. If a crisis does exist, it is a crisis in men's hearts. Men are short-sighted, selfish, and narrow-minded. They fail to appreciate the great depth of Christ's love for us. Um, it's, it's very, very sad um, to see division in the church. And we're seeing a lot of division in the church. Just the rapture, the view of the rapture itself is horrible to see how many people are just fighting and arguing over, you know, everyone has to be right. That's not what the hope of the rapture is supposed to be. It's supposed to be joy and encouragement, not um, bare, bare knuckle boxing. That's not what this is. When we speak of a person's heart, we refer, we refer not just to sentiments, but to the whole person. In his loving dealings. Um, Jesus on the cross with his heart o um, overflowing with love for men is such an eloquent commentary on the value of people and things that words only get in the way. Um, men, their happiness and their life are so important to the very Son of God, um, to the very Son that God gave himself to redeem and cleanse and raise them up. Who will not love this heart so wounded Who will not return love for love? Who will not embrace a heart so pure? We who are made of flesh will repay love with love. We will embrace our wounded one whose hands and feet ungodly men have nailed. We will cling to his side and to his heart. And let us pray that we be worthy of linking our heart with his love. Um, with his love of, I mean, he was wounded with a lance. He was already dead then, but... It's still hard to think about. Um, if a man is not humble, he will try to make a God his own, but not in the divine way, which Christ made possible when he said, take, eat this, this is my body. The proud man tries to confine the grandeur of God within human limits. Then reason the cold, blind reason that is so different from the mind imbued with faith and even from the well-directed mind of someone capable of enjoying and loving things becomes irrational in a person's attempt to reduce everything 
to um to his to his cramped human experience god says i know the plans i have for you plans for peace and not affliction was god's promise through um through jeremiah um doesn't it just clearly show that god does um does love us in this way he did not con come to condemn us to accuse us of meanness and smallness he came to save us pardon us excuse us bring us peace and joy but note that god does not say in exchange for your own heart i will give you a will a will of pure spirit no he gives us a heart a human heart like christ's i don't have one heart for loving god and another for loving people i love christ and the father and the holy spirit we must be very human for otherwise We can't understand the divine. God is absolutely a God of love. He loves us so much that he sent his son who died a terrible, terrible death. He loves us that much. But don't be fooled. Um, not everyone is a child of God. Not He didn't die for everyone as people think. He died for those who will believe in him everyone who believes in him. If you don't have Jesus, you are not a child of God. No matter what people try to tell you, no matter what these false teachers are saying, you're not a child of God if you, um, if you don't have Jesus. Um, this is a very scary world and there's a lot going on every day. There's more news, more news, politics, economics, um, disasters but we can have peace in jesus if you have jesus you can know peace the bible contains many verses about peace including ones that describe god's promise of peace peacemakers and other aspects of peace john 14 27 jesus says peace i leave with you my peace i give to you not as the world gives do i give to you do not let your hearts be troubled neither let them be afraid um, Philippians 4 verse 7 says, And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Matthew chapter 5 verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. James chapter 3 verse 18 says, Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Proverbs 16 verse 7 says, When the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, he causes their enemies to make peace with them. Romans 14 verse 19 says, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Isaiah 26 3 through 4, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. That doesn't mean that you agree with what's happening in the world. That doesn't mean that you condone sin. It means that you can have peace in Jesus Christ. And don't let anyone steal your peace. Just don't. Um, I want to look at Psalm chapter 119, well, Psalm 119, verse 165. Those who love your law have great peace, and nothing causes them to stumble. If there was ever a practical idea, peace definitely meets the criteria. Um, there are currently 67 countries in the world experiencing some level of war, with 718 militias, guerrillas, and terrorists, um, terrorists, separatists, anarchy, anarchic groups involved. America is not included in this list, but we are definitely at war. We are enmeshed in cultural, racial, political, and moral wars. When people are shot in the streets simply out of anger and rage, I call that war. Um, when our president is almost, our, our future president is almost assassinated, um, I call that war. Um, the world has been in conflict since Adam and Eve. Um, since they since since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden sin brings war our enemy Satan has an agenda to steal kill and destroy Sin is behind every conflict 
every battle, every struggle, every disagreement, whether the fight is between two first world nations or between a husband and a wife, sin is at the heart of it all. So what is peace? Is peace simply the absence of conflict? The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. It means completeness in numbers, soundness and safety in body, health, prosperity and welfare. Um, it also means quietness, contentment and tranquility. Peace is what everyone desires, but outward peace, peace in our world, will not come until Jesus comes back to rule this world. So how can the word of God bring us peace today? Well, I see two specific ways that God's word brings peace. The living word brings peace with God. In John um, 16 verse 33, Jesus told his disciples, These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Jesus is the Word. John 1 teaches us this truth. He is the living Word of God revealed in human flesh. John 1 verses 1 and 14, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came to reconcile us to the Father. Because of our personal sin, we are enemies of God. By praying our um, sin debt, by, by paying our sin debt on the cross, when we accept the gift of salvation, we are at peace with God. Romans 5, 1 through 2, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Salvation through the word, through Jesus, brings peace with God. Consider our scripture again in Psalm 119 verse 165. Those who love your law have great peace and nothing causes them to stumble. The Hebrew word for stumble is um, mikshol, mikshol, um, M-I-K-S-H-O-W-L and means that against which anyone stumbles, a stumbling, a stumbling block, a cause of falling or failure, an obstacle or enticement. So how does God's law brings, uh, bring us great peace and keep us from stumbling? <sighs> to love God's law is to obey Him. It is to make His word the plumb line by which we make every decision, take every action, speak every word, consider every thought. It is the lining up of our life to the wisdom and the direction found in God's word. Loving God's law means that I truly believe that he knows best and that even when it's difficult, I will do what is necessary to align myself with his word. This brings supernatural peace to our life. Obeying God brings peace in a very practical sense. Sinful choices following my flesh only leads to chaos uncertainty, pain, and regret, but the practical wisdom of making wise and holy choices because we love God's word and believe it to be true brings peace to our life. It keeps us from stumbling. Proverbs 3, 1 through 2 and 5 through 6, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Proverbs 3, 13 through 17. How blessed is the man who finds wisdom, and the man who gains understanding. For her profit is better than the profit of silver, and her gain better than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire compares with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. You guys know how much I love Proverbs. If you've been watching my, um, any, if you've been keeping, keeping up on my channel, um, obeying God is a matter of the heart. It is not just about keeping the law, but loving the law. There's a difference. The one who tries to keep the law is a Pharisee. We can pursue an outward righteousness, but still have a hard and unsurrendered heart. Romans 9, 30-33 What shall we say then? 
that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel pursued a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. I'm always saying no one who puts their faith in Jesus will ever be disappointed. Trying to earn God's favor by doing the right thing is pursuing peace on our terms. This will never bring us peace because we can never measure up. We miss the point, and instead of Jesus, the living word, bringing us peace with God, he becomes a stumbling stone, and we are offended with him. We have neither peace with God or the peace of God. The peace promised by God's word begins with salvation. It is accepting what Christ did on the cross to reconcile us to God. From our position of peace with God, we can then do life with the peace of God. We can trust that his ways, um, that his ways work. And that obedience will bring peace to our relationships, our work, our families, and our homes. <sighs> Keep walking by faith. If you're not, examine your heart. Do you truly know him? Have you accepted his gift of salvation? Are you obeying his word? Are you living your life um, by the plumb line of truth? We may never see peace in our lifetime, in our external circumstances, but we can experience the unexplained supernatural peace of God and with God according to his word. People everywhere search for peace. They sing songs about it and travel on pilgrimages to find it. They even wage war to protect it. Many wealthy, famous, and powerful people um, would trade everything for just one moment of peace. What they often find, however, is the world's false peace, which is different from the peace offered by Jesus. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. John 14, 27. The peace offered by the world is an empty promise and can only bring temporary comfort. God's peace is a permanent peace offered by the only one who can be trusted to keep um, his word and heal our sin. During times of prosperity, nations experience temporary peace. But when economies struggle, countries find themselves on the brink of civil war as well as war with their neighbors. Yeah. The peace of the world is a precarious thing. Conflict erupts when people are hungry. Peace disappears when circumstances turn ugly. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. Micah, chapter 3, verse 5. In the Old Testament, God warned the Israelites that if they intermarried for political reasons, they would face the temptation to compromise their love for the one true God and end up serving false gods. This compromise, though, um, though it would create a temporary absence of conflict, would ultimately lead to destruction. Um, Exodus 34, 12 says, Be careful not to make a treaty with the inhabitants of the land that you are going to enter, otherwise they will become a snare among you. And Ezra chapter 9, verse 12 says, Therefore do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an, inher for an inheritance um, to your children forever. When asked what's wrong with the world today, Many will point to volatile stock markets, corrupt governments, disappearing rainforests, poor diets, lack of health care, broken families, overcrowded schools, inflation, um, the border crisis, and so much more. The world tries to fix these problems by doing good, feeding children, building wells, building walls, regulating markets, conserving wildlife, funding charter schools, and thereby achieving a type of peace. The world's peace um, tries to fix the symptoms of sin, but fails to see how the root of the problem is the sin disease itself, something that can only be healed by Christ, not by money, regulation, or reform. Dealing with the symptoms of sin, but failing to diagnose the sin itself is not new. In the Old Testament, 
False prophets treated sin lightly and proclaimed the problem solved when it wasn't. Jeremiah 6.14, again, they have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. <sighs> Ezekiel 13.10, precisely, because they have misled my people, saying, peace, when there is no peace. And because when the pe um, people build a wall, these prophets smear it with whitewash. And that's what we're doing today. In contrast to the world's promise of peace, God's peace is permanent and firmly grounded in his word, he doesn't ignore our sin. He heals it, making his peace a different kind of peace from what is um, can be found in the world. Um, when circumstances are free of conflict, we enjoy momentary peace. But when we face difficult relationships, health problems, and financial crisis, the momentary quiet is disrupted and chaos rules the day. Um, sorry, one second. Okay. Um, our God offers peace in the midst of chaos. His peace doesn't change with the circumstances. It is secure in spite of the circumstances. Isaiah 54, 10 says, For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. John 16, 33 says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Young or old, male or female, we've all experienced um, the pain of broken promises. No matter how much our families, friends, and co-workers love us, at some point, someone will disappoint us. And despite our best intentions, we are likely to disappoint someone else by saying one thing and doing another. God's word, however, can be trusted. He never contradicts himself or acts in a way that is out of character. He will never disappoint. Um, Psalm 119, 165 says, Grace, great peace. Have those who love your law, nothing can make them stumble. And Isaiah 26, 3, to keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. All religions other than true Christianity have one thing in common. They try to achieve peace with God by doing works and following rules. Christianity is different. In Christ, we are offered peace with God because we who once were far off, Ephesians 2, 13, have been reconciled to God through Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus' sacrifice addresses the root of the problem that the world ignores. By his sacrifice, he bridged the gap that sin inserted between us and God. He took the punishment of our sin, and in, ex and in exchange, he gives us peace with God. Isaiah 53, 5, But he was um, pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Ephesians 2.14, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down his flesh, the dividing wall of hostility. And Isaiah 32, verse 17, And the effect of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness, quietness, and trust forever. While we experience eternal peace through reconciliation with God in Christ, we also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because of him, we enjoy the blessings of peace in our daily lives, even when we find ourselves in the midst of turmoil. The best way to overcome a fear at the end of the day is to be spiritually prepared for it. First and foremost, you must have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ in order to have eternal life. Only through him can you receive forgiveness of, um, the forgiveness of sin and have eternity with God. If God is your father, there's really nothing to worry about. Um, second, every Christian should live a life worthy of the calling we have in Christ. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 teaches, Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Knowing Christ and walking in his will Go a long way towards diminishing fear of any kind. 
Christians are told what will happen in the end, and it's encouraging. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will, def will descend from heaven with a cry of a, with a, sh I'm sorry. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Rather than fear the future, we are called to, antici to anticipate the future with joy. Um, in Christ, we will be caught up to meet him and we will always be with the Lord. Further, scripture says we do not need to fear judgment day. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. First John four seventeen through 18. The Apostle Peter reveals that even if our future holds suffering, we need not fear. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. 1 Peter 3.14 Peter and many other early believers endured many hardships and even death because of their faith in Christ. Suffering is not to be feared. It is a blessing when it is born for the name of Jesus. Now, um... That's not to say that you're going to be going through the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, the um, seven years um, promised. We're not going to be here for that. But that doesn't mean that we don't have tribulation today. That doesn't mean that we don't have fears today. We have peace in Jesus. We know that the wrath, of, when the wrath of God is poured out on this unbelieving and unrepentant world, we're not going to be here for that because Christ lives inside of us. And the wrath of God will never be poured out on Christ again. So we know we're leaving soon. Um, those who do not know Christ do not have the promise of peace for the future. For them, there is a real concern because they have not settled the issue of where they will spend eternity. Those who do, um, those who do know Christ do not fear the end of days. Instead, we strive to live a life worthy of our calling, live with confidence, suffer patiently, Anticipate Jesus' return and rest in the knowledge that our times are in his hands. Psalms 31.15 Faith and fear cannot exist together. Faith is described in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 as being, a certain, um, as being certain of what we do not see. It is an absolute belief that God is constantly working behind the scenes in every area of our lives. Even when there is no tangible evidence to support, um, to support that fact. On the other hand, fear simply stated is unbelief or weak belief. And unbelief gains the upper hand in our thoughts. Fear takes hold of our emotions. Our deliverance from fear and worry is based on faith, which is the very opposite of unbelief. We need to understand that faith is not something that we can produce in ourselves. Faith is also a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Um, and faithfulness is described as a fruit or characteristic that is produced in our lives by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. The Christian faith is a, a confident assurance in a God who loves us, who knows our thoughts, who cares about our deepest needs. That faith continues to grow as we study the Bible and learn the attributes of his amazing character. The more we learn about God, the more we can see him working in our lives and the stronger our faith grows. A growing faith is what we desire to have and what God desires to produce in us. But how in day-to-day -day life can we develop a faith that conquers our fears? The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. 
The careful study of God's word is of primary importance in developing a strong faith. God wants us to know him and completely rely on his direction in our lives. It's through the hearing, reading, and meditation in the scriptures that we begin to experience a strong, confident faith that excludes worry and fear. Spending time in prayer and quiet worship develops a relationship with our Heavenly Father that sees us through even the darkest of nights. In the Psalms, we see a picture of David who, like us, experienced times of fear. Psalm 56, 3 reveals his faith with these words, When I am afraid, I will trust in you. Psalm 119 is filled with verses expressing um, the way in which David treasured God's word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. That's verse 10. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways in verse 15. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Verse 11. These are revealing words which speak wisdom to us today. If you don't understand the script, or if you don't understand the scriptures or know the scriptures, how are you going to um, stand in this world today? God is kind and understanding towards our weaknesses, but he requires us to go forward in faith. And the Bible is clear that faith does not mature and strengthen without trials. Adversity is God's most effective tool to develop a strong faith. That pattern is evident in scripture. God takes each one of us through fearful situations. And as we learn to obey God's word and allow it to saturate our thoughts, we find each trial becomes a stepping stone to a stronger and deeper faith. It gives us that ability to say, he sustained me in the past, he'll carry me through today, and he'll uphold me in the future. God worked this way in David's life. When David volunteered to fight against Goliath, he said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. 1 Samuel 17, 37. David knew the God who had sustained him through a dangerous through dangerous situations in the past. He had seen and experienced God's power and protection in his life, and this developed within him a fearless faith. The word of God is rich with promises for us to take hold of and claim for ourselves. When we face financial trouble, Philippians 4.19 tells us, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. If we are anxious about a future decision, Psalm 32, 8 reminds us that God will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. In sickness, we can remember that Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given, who has been given to us. If someone turns against us, we can be comforted by the words in Romans 8.31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Throughout life, we will continue to face various trials that would cause us fear. But God assures us that we can know a calm peace through every situation. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your, your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 7. Everyone is afraid sometime about something. We live in a world that offers plenty of chances to fear, and we can be rather creative in thinking of new things to be fearful of. Maybe that's why one of the most often repeated commands in the Bible is do not be afraid. Of course, the Bible does more than issue the command. It gives us good reasons why we do not need to be afraid. So here's some biblical keys to not being afraid. Trust in God. This has to be the starting point. Do we trust God or not? The psalmist models the proper choice. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Psalm 56, verse 3. Faith overcomes fear. Mark 4, 40. We remember that our good shepherd is with us even through the darkest valley. Psalm 23, 4. We do not need to be afraid because he will never, ever forsake us. Hebrews 13, 5. He is our salvation, our strength, our defense, 
and he has become my salvation. Isaiah 12, verse 2. In trusting God, we pray to him. We believe his word, and we obey his commands. Scripture abounds with reasons why we should not be afraid based on our trust in the Lord. Um, trust in God with will counteract the effects of fear. The Bible's admonish, um, admonition to not be afraid naturally implies faith in God. Um, a, Scotter, a Scottish minister, Alexandra, Alexander McLaren, said faith, which is trust, and fear are opposite are opposite poles. If a man has the one, he can scarcely have the other in vigorous operation. He that has his trust set upon God does not need to dread anything except the weakening or the paralyzing of that trust. That's from the health in the desert and the tree by the river in Triumphant Certainties and other sermons. Um, that was printed in 1905. Um, don't focus on the fear. <laughs> don't focus on the fear. We choose what we will dwell on. Um, to focus on the source of fear is to engender more fear. To focus on the one who takes fear away is to find solace. We can choose to fix our thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. We think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Philippians 4 verse 8. As um, Jarius Darius, uh, the synagogue ruler, was bringing Jesus home to save his daughter, Jairus. I think, I think that's how you pronounce it, Jairus. Um, to save his daughter, he received news that his daughter had died. Mark 5.35 Immediately, Jesus told Jairus, Don't be afraid, just believe. That's in verse 36. Um, in other words, Jairus must forego the natural focus on the tragedy and fear and focus instead on faith and the Lord's nearness. In choosing to not be afraid, we remember that the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. 1 John 4.4 4. So choose to praise the Lord. How good is it to sing praises to our God? How pleasant and how fitting. Psalm 147 verse 1 Praise is an antidote to fear, and gratitude negates worry. Habakkuk the prophet was fearful of the invasion of his country, and he described um, his fear vividly. I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound, De decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Habakkuk 3.16 But in the following verses, the prophet handles his fear in a godly manner. He waited patiently to see the Lord's intervention, verse 15. He, I mean, I'm sorry, verse 16. He acknowledged that difficult times could be on the way in 17, and he, he proposed to praise the Lord in verse 18. And he focused on the Lord's power and promises on, in 19. In that focus, Habakkuk, Habakkuk learned to not be afraid. And that's how he ended his book, on a note of praise to the Lord. Remember the future that God has promised his children. We should not worry about tomorrow. Jesus clearly taught, in this life, we have God's promise to meet every need his children have and to accomplish his work in us. As David passed the throne to his son, he encouraged Solomon in the knowledge of God's plan for him. Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work of the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. First Chronicles 28 verse 20 In the next life, the redeemed have an even greater hope. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into, the, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. 1 Peter 1, 3-5 Jesus' gentle words gladden the hearts of all who all who tend to fear. Luke 12, 32, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Notice he calls us little flock. It's because there aren't many of us. And that's very sad. Um, combat the temptation to fear. We are in a spiritual battle. 
and one of the enemy's tactics is to promote fear. In his grace, God has given us spiritual armor to wage a successful battle. We have the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Ephesians 6, 16. There's a wonderful promise here. The shield we wield extinguishes the flames of all the devil's darts, including the temptation to fear. Faith overcomes fear of any kind, and it is with confidence in God that we take our stand. See verse 11. Um, part of combating temptation is following the path of wisdom and obedience, which always brings good results. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your, your sleep, sleep will be sweet. Proverbs 3.24 John Newton's hymn, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds, first published in 1779, expresses the hopeful spirit within the believer. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes his sorrows, heals his wounds, and drives away his fear. Rest in the Lord is a frequently used expression in the Bible. When the psalmist says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him, in Psalm 37, verse 7, he's not talking about the physical rest that involves taking a break from activity, relaxing, napping, or stopping to gather strength to continue or complete some physical undertaking. Rest in the Lord refers to a spiritual rest from confusion, worry, stress, useless human effort, and a break from all internal, external, mortal, and spiritual enemies. The Hebrew word translated as rest means to be at peace, to be still, to be quiet or calm. In place of rest in the Lord, some Bible translations say be still before the Lord, be silent before the Lord, surrender yourself to the Lord, and be still in the presence of the Lord. These versions convey the essential idea that to rest and be at peace, one must dwell in the presence of the Lord, surrounded by his Lordship. In the Old Testament, God promised the people of Israel a life of peace in the Promised Land and rest in his presence. But this restful, peaceful living depended on the Israelites remaining faithful and obedient to God alone by keeping their covenant with him. To those whose um, hearts strayed from him, God said they would never enjoy his rest. Psalm 95, 7 through 11. Eventually, because of a widespread disobedience and unfaithfulness, the nation of Israel was taken into, captiv into captivity in Babylon. After returning from exile, once again, the promise of rest in the Lord's presence was presented. So do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant. Do not be dismayed, Israel. For I will bring you home again from distant lands, and your children will return from exile. Israel will return to a life of peace and quiet, and no one will terrorize them. Jeremiah 30 verse 10. But again, the people failed to learn that resting in the Lord meant surrendering wholly to the Lord in righteous living. The fruits of that righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be the quietness and confidence forever. Isaiah 32 17. In the New Testament, the book of Hebrews declares the good news that those who believe in Jesus Christ can enter his rest. God's promise of entering his rest still stands, so we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them, but it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. Hebrews 4, 1 through 3. As believers, we are not granted immunity from life's storms, but we have a choice about how we react to those storms. Our natural tendency might be to run around frantically looking for help, trying to save ourselves from trouble. We can either respond um, frenetically or rest in the Lord's presence. We can either waste our time worrying or trust in the Lord to take care of us. Jesus said, come to me, all you, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Matthew 11, 28-30. The writer of Hebrews also tells us that there is a future, final rest for believers in heaven. Um, Hebrews 4, 9-11. And in the meantime, we can rest in the Lord 
by taking everything, all our burdens and problems and anxieties to him in prayer. We can tell God what we need, even as we remember and thank him for all that he has done for us already. As we do this, as we abide in Jesus Christ and God's presence, he, he promises to pour us, um, pour into us a supernatural, incomprehensible peace to guard our hearts and minds. Philippians 4, 6-7 through 7. Right here and now, we can quiet ourselves, be still, and surrender ourselves to the Lord. We can see him as Isaiah did, high and lifted up. Um, Isaiah 6, 1. He is sovereign over the whole earth, over our lives, and over every enemy, both internal and external human and spiritual. Um, Isaiah 46, 9 through 11, we can peacefully wait for him. We can be steadfast, longing, and always looking for um, to him for help. This is how we rest in the Lord. Always looking forward to his promises, um, which he's going to keep every promise that he has made. He has a crown waiting for us. For those of us waiting, um, who are going to lo who love his appearing, he's got a crown waiting for us. And not just us, but those who are have already um, died, those who um, have gone to sleep before us, waiting for the Lord Jesus, um, they're going to be there in the rapture. If I die today, I'm still going to be in the rapture. I'll just be going first because the dead in Christ will rise first. We have blessings um, throughout our lives. Um, we have... we. No matter how hard things are, there's always a reason to praise God. There's always blessings. And if you look for the blessings rather than the curses, you start to see God's work in your life. But you need to be reading your Bible. You need to be praying. You need to keep on the armor of God at all times, every day. And, um, you know, the Bible itself is the sword, um, is the sword. It's our only offensive, offensive weapon. It's the sword of the Spirit. The Holy Bible. Read it, and I don't care what translation you're reading. You're not going to find me um, griping about that on my channel. I have many translations. I've got Greek. I've got Hebrew. I've got the Bible, um, the, the Prophecy Bible, which I am planning to share with you soon. I'm considering um, looking into the book of Revelation from my and I'll be using my Prophecy Bible for that. Uh, my next video very well may be the Church Age, Revelation chapters 1 through 5. I'm seriously considering that as my next um, video, so there you go, heads up. Although I do have a couple others that I really have put a lot of work into, but the Holy Spirit keeps leading me other places, so I follow the Holy Spirit. I'm going to listen to God. Um, the world's crazy, but you can know peace. And peace only comes through Jesus, a personal relationship with him. He's listening. He will hear you if you pray to him. He's waiting for you to talk to him. You don't have to be fancy. You don't have to pray out loud. You don't have to strike a pose. Just talk to him. He's waiting to hear from you. Um, and read your Bible. Don't fall for the ways of the world. Don't conform to the world. Sin is still sin today. What was a sin 2,000 years ago is still a sin today. We don't conform to the world. We don't, we don't, um, we don't condone it, but we are to live like Christ. And just because some of us are, those of us who are waiting for the rapture, that doesn't make us, the pre-tribulation rapture doesn't make us weak. If we actually were here during the tribulation, which we know that's not going to happen because Jesus is taking us. But for those who say, oh, well, you know, it's so dangerous to teach this because, you know, you're going to find yourself here and you're going to take the mark because you're not going to understand what's going on and you're going to fall for that. That's not true. I, Those of us who are watching and waiting for the pre-tribulation rapture of Jesus, who are grounded in God's word in the Bible, which this is very, very well, this is taught in the Bible that he is coming for us. Jesus said he is coming for us and we, we are not appointed to wrath and we will not be here for the hour of trial uh, and we will see the day approaching. I mean, the, the, the rapture and the second coming, those are two separate events. Um, but if we did actually happen to be here, we're not stupid. We know the word. We know what's coming. 
I would recognize immediately not a single one of us is going to bow down and worship um, a man. Not one of us. And none of us will be taking any CBDC. We're not going to be a part of the cashless society. Even They're rolling that out right now. It's already being used in many places. The CBDCs, they're being used already. That's not the mark, um, I don't think. But it is definitely beast technology. To say that we don't understand what beast technology is or that we don't understand what it means to persevere. Do you realize that people, Christians throughout the world, are already being killed today? We're not in the tribulation. We're in the beginning. But that doesn't mean that we don't we, we can't live through hardships. I will never, never deny Jesus Christ. And no, because I have the discernment of the Holy Spirit, I would never be fooled. But the Bible tells me I'm not going to be here. And I trust in Jesus. And you need to too. You can have peace and joy. And it's wonderful. And so sad that so many people are missing this encouragement. Um, they actually think they're going to have to go through these horrible, horrible times um, described in Revelations chapter 6 through like 18, 7, 19. It's very sad because God has promised us that he will never forsake us or abandon us. So if you don't know Jesus, get to know him and get to know him today. Tomorrow's not promised. While we're waiting for the pre-tribulation rapture, um, we could get hit by a car. I've got blood clots in my leg. Um, it wouldn't take much for one of them to get loose and go to my lungs. So we aren't promised tomorrow. Whether you believe in the rapture or not, that's not a salvational issue. Um, but trusting in Jesus Christ, that is. He's the only way to heaven. So I, 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 I find a way. Find a way to believe in him. Pull out your Bible. I suggest starting with chapter with the book of John and then just keep going. And I also love Proverbs and Psalms. Um, many, 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 many. But I, I love all the books, to be honest with you. But Proverbs, Psalms, Hebrews, Acts, Romans. But start with John and then just keep going. And um, see where that takes you. Ask the Holy Spirit to come upon you and to reveal the truth to you. And he will. I want to see you in heaven.